Effective protection of any species really um, is only possible if people who see the species, who interact with the species, who might eat the species, um, actually care about the species. So here on the coast, we have that situation because we have First Nations and fishers and British Columbians all care about salmon. And I think that is maybe their saving grace. A lot of uh, Chinook, steelhead, coho populations in the south of the province, as well as a number of Sockeye salmon populations are in trouble, and the further south you go, the bigger the problem gets. We have a perfectly good wild salmon policy that can be used as a roadmap for protecting wild salmon on the coast of BC. It is well designed, it is well researched, and it doesn't need any revision. It simply should be executed and executed immediately, and of course, with appropriate funding. To protect wild salmon, Coastwide, we need to know the status of the populations in the many creeks, rivers, and streams, and we need to identify conservation units for these populations in line with the wild salmon policy. The capacity of the federal government to obtain that information has diminished significantly recently, and we'll need to find new partnerships between the DFO and the community, especially First Nations, and expand programs such as the Pacific Salmon Foundation. Salmon Explorer Program. People talk about climate change as being in the future. For Pacific salmon, they're a very sensitive metric for the, the environment. It's already here. We're already dealing with it. We know that the climate is changing very, very quickly. Well, we don't know what those fish are going to need in the future in order to cope with these changes. We need to make sure we have a diversified portfolio within each and every one of our species, and I mean a genetic portfolio, so that at least some of those populations are going to be able to adapt and therefore persist on our coast. Within BC, protecting habitat is a really key investment, and without habitat, salmon, we know, won't thrive. The most important thing we can do is protect salmon habitats, and that includes both freshwater, estuary, and marine habitats. Salmon integrate from mountain streams to the high seas. I think there's many threats to the wild salmon of the BC coast, but I think that the greatest reversible impact is salmon farms. They can be removed. The sea lice amplification, the potential introduction of exotic pathogens and application of local pathogens can be turned off. And these fish can come and go to sea without bathing through the effluent of these farms. I think in the short term, the easiest thing we can do to protect wild salmon on this coast would be to get much better control over fish farming. We know that the pathogens that come from these open net pens are infecting and killing our wild fish. And that is a problem that can be very easily solved by reducing the numbers of fish in the farms, by reducing the farms themselves, by getting them out of the key salmon corridors, and by better treatment of pathogens on the farms. DFO is not even checking for the Pison mu virus in the audit samples they take for, for uh, monitoring the health of the fish in the fish farms, and there's just no excuse for that. I mean, certainly for Newfoundland and the East Coast, there's the whole issue of interbreeding between the introduction of domesticated traits into wild populations, which is not an issue here. You know, the focus here is much more on the disease issues and parasite issues, and obviously those are certainly of, of concern. I'm not as familiar obviously here as I would be in Ireland or in Europe but I think there's uh, some concern about viruses and disease but I, I would still focus on unregulated salmon uh, lice uh, in the spring prior to when the wild smolts are migrating. There's evidence that if there isn't adequate control and synchronized control across areas uh, on the migration route that there could be very serious mortality of these migrating smolts. Uh, one thing they intend to do is that to keep some parts of the coastline free from any type of agriculture so it's a, a safe haven in some parts where you have specific um, important salmon rivers should be free from fish farming in norway we have uh, planning at the municipality level on, in the coastal zone which is legally binding for the aquaculture industry and i'm not sure if if you have the same thing in canada that in my opinion would be a good meeting ground for the different interests. It's been clear that the siting of fish farms is unfortunate. 
They're located in places that really elevate the risk of disease exchange between wild and farm fish. An obvious management action to respond to that risk would be to relocate these farms. We heard in this workshop about incentives for salmon farmers to move their farms out of the, out of the water, close containment systems. Uh, we don't seem to have a lot of those incentives in Canada. We could learn by what we heard from the Europeans on providing those incentives and, and removing those farms is probably one of the most important things we can do. The Cohen Commission recommendations are specific to Fraser Sockeye and specific to the Discovery Islands. And I think that they should be extended uh, far beyond that to all species of salmon and to all areas of the coast where aquaculture might be impacting them. It's the same fish and they're getting the same impacts and uh, we're not doing anything about that. And land-based closed containment systems simply separate the farm salmon from the wild salmon because we can locate these farms inland and there's not a, a salmon swimming by. Uh, Land-based closed containment systems are now known to be technically, biologically, and economically viable. And globally, there's over a dozen farms producing salmon. There still seems to be a reluctance within the department for the fish health and aquaculture people to even interact with other science members of DFO, let alone science professionals outside of the department. Fisheries and Oceans Canada potentially has a conflict of interest. They are mandated to protect and conserve wild fish stocks and habitat and biodiversity, but that may be compromised by their alignment with industry. I think local knowledge is huge. I think that our current system is more top down and I think we're finally getting to this place where we need to involve local communities both in the collection of data but also using that data to inform their local community decision making, uh, in particular First Nations. I have learned that a single entity can't protect our salmon. It needs to be a collaboration among academics, government, First Nations, and it's only when we'll come together that we can actually protect our salmon. It does come back to this basic idea of empowering those people and organizations and governments that care for and want to champion wild salmon with the information they need to be active participants in those decision-making processes. DFO is now still of the mindset of promoting aquaculture and the fate of the wild salmon um, is secondary. That has to shift. Where DFO recognizes the wild salmon as being not just a, an important food source for First Nations and other people, but also the ecological role they play in sustaining all of the, uh, the West Coast. I mean, they are the ones that are bringing the nutrients into these streams. They're feeding the, the plants, the, the bears, the forest, and to lose that compromises uh, ecosystem security along, along the coast. Canada has been given direction by the Supreme Court to pursue reconciliation with First Nations people. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans being one segment of that government needs to ensure that their actions are grounded in that. And so in terms of how do they approach reconciliation, um, it must represent a fundamental change. In terms of how they operate, the management of fisheries within traditional territories must include First Nations to really see Canada become all that it can be in terms of a democracy and to be a, a true leader in human rights.